So I am so excited. We have been planning a visit by Honorata for years. We were just talking. We met with her after my husband and I went to Kenya and kind of started the first round of research. Um, we talked about her coming. She has tons of family visiting her from India, but she, just, she was incredibly generous and offered to come um, this weekend. And we just could not be more happy to have her here. Um, Anurata is the founder and executive director of the Oakland Institute. Some of you um, might know her, or remember her when she was a co-director of Food First. She's a renowned expert on trade, development, human rights, and agriculture issues. She's a recipient of several awards. She was named as the most valuable thinker in 2008 by The Nation magazine. In addition to being a prolific author, Anurata has addressed Congress, the United Nations. She's given several keynote addresses including invitational events from governments and universities, and has been interviewed on CNN, BBC World, CBS, ABC, Al Jazeera, everywhere. She is a role model to me of a fierce woman um, who's an organizer while also being a mother. And I'm just so proud that you're here. Please join me in welcoming Hannah Noretta. I've heard the word fierce used for me uh, a few times this evening, but I have to tell you, I'm really nervous. <laughs> what an incredible, incredible evening, and what an amazing crowd. I think I was in this church, if I'm not mistaken, in 1999, organizing around Seattle, so it's beautiful. It's beautiful to be back here. So, So yeah, it's very nice to be back in your city, one of the cities where I'm very proud to have been pepper sprayed and tear gassed with many of you. <laughs> um, happy birthday, Community Alliance, 15th birthday. That's pretty awesome. Thank you for being around. I'm very, very honored to be the guest at your 10th dinner. As Heather mentioned, we have tried to make this work and I was beginning to feel like a little bit of a prima donna. I can't get my act together. So I'm so honored and so privileged to be here. Um, just one thing around GMO bananas that Heather mentioned. Uh, one thing she didn't mention, the audacity of these people. They stole that gene from Papua New Guinea without compensating, without recognizing the intellectual property rights of the farmers and the diversity, biodiversity and the richness of bananas in Papua New Guinea. Then they use the poor students in this country as guinea pigs. Usually it's people and students in my part of the world, but you get the feeling, right? And then you bring it to Uganda, a solution for a problem that does not exist. This is what Gates Foundation development looks like. Now contrast it with the Community Alliance for Global Justice. This is what global solidarity looks like. And thank you, Community Alliance, for being around for 15 years and another 15 and 150 years to you. So um, let's see. Heather talked to me a lot about what I'm going to say today. And I'm going to, of course, be a rebel and do what I want to do. Uh, or she won't have me here. Um, Let's start with 2007, 2008. Uh, I don't know, many of you, I'm quite sure, are aware of it, the high food price crisis. The prices of food shot up by nearly 80%. We might not have felt it as much in the United States, but in the developing world, where the poorest people spend nearly 80% of their income on food, it was devastating. Nearly 30 countries were identified that they would go through a political crisis. Governments would be toppled. There were food riots. And at the same time, there was a thing, you know, financial crisis was happening. Suddenly, all these pension funds, endowments were looking for the next commodity to invest in. You know, the Silicon Valley, the, uh, the whole bubble had burst, the housing market had uh, been destroyed. So the whole thing was, where are we going to invest in? Within that scenario, you had the La Aquila Food Summit. The G8 came together, and they made a commitment of $20 billion to support country-owned strategies for food security. And many of us who have worked on 
food issues, food sovereignty, we were like, wow, finally the G8 get it. They're going to support what works for third world countries instead of telling them what to do. And of course, by 2012, new alliance for food security and malnutrition was launched. A great way to deliver predominantly Africa to multinational corporations. At the same time, I don't know how many of you have heard of EBA, Enabling the Business of Agriculture. Enabling the Business of Agriculture is an index which was asked by the Dutch, Danish, US, UK, and the Gates Foundation. They went to the World Bank and they asked the World Bank to create a ranking system. You rank countries, you know, you give a scorecard. What do you like to do business with in terms of agriculture? So if you're Sierra Leone and you say, we are going to practice agroecology, you get a bad ranking. If you are Liberia and you say, we are going to protect land rights of a smallholder farmers, you get a ranking even worse than these guys. However, if you're South Africa and you say, you know what? I'm going to displace people, forget about free prior informed consent, you're ranked first. So Ethiopia jumps in and says, guess what? We will do that, but we will take like a day to give you the land lease, and we'll make land leases for 99 years. So you come second, you come first. So it's basically a slippery slope, creating a system where doing away with labor rights, environmental rights is actually recognized and uh, rewarded. So this money, that comes from the new alliance to African countries is dependent on the conditionalities. It's almost like structural adjustment programs. And by the way, doing business rankings were created the year structural adjustment programs were ended because of global challenge and protest by civil society. So they get rid of one program and they recreate it with the other. Now, why am I telling you all about it? Again, whether it is a new alliance for food security and malnutrition, whether it is your GM bananas, whether it is enabling the business of agriculture, the five donors that are pushing that agenda, United States, United Kingdom, the Dutch government and the Danish government, and the fifth is not a government. It has such huge amounts of power, it's in your backyard and that's called the Gates Foundation. So what does it all mean? So at the Oakland Institute, just to tell you in one quick line, we're an independent policy think tank created in 2010, uh, sorry, in 2003. Um, our idea and intent was to be a progressive think tank, not a liberal think tank, but a progressive think tank. Um, just a quick joke around it, I was telling some people earlier, I'm always asked, why are you called the Oakland Institute? You know, usually progressive groups are Center for Human Rights, Center for Global Justice. And thinking of think tanks, you know, you look at Cato, Hudson, they don't call themselves Center for Generating Unemployment, Center for Creating <laughs> Hunger. So we thought instead of, you know, putting all the, all the stickers, bumper stickers on the car, you know, we wanted to be noticed by the media, so we're the Oakland Institute. But in 2007, we were asked by the G24, which is a group of 24 developing countries, the big guys, you know, Brazil, South Africa, India, to do a report for them looking at the impact, at the causes and impact of the high food price crisis. And in the course of doing that work, we saw this phenomena, which was, of, which was described initially as a win-win. So you had resource-rich countries, uh, but cash poor, suddenly negotiating with countries that were resource poor but cash rich. So the idea was for Gulf states could go to African countries, they could take over lands, they could grow food, in, and the agri uh, African countries would get infrastructure development, they would get jobs, and so it seemed like a win-win according to FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization, and IFAD. And as a think tank, we really wanted to see if it's really a win-win. You know, the whole idea was that this agricultural investment will lead to food security in Africa, it'll lead to jobs, it'll lead to infrastructure. So very naively, we thought we will travel to some countries in Africa, north, south, east, west, look at the diverse examples, countries like South Sudan that were just becoming an independent country, look at countries that have gone through civil war, Sierra Leone, Mozambique, um, and look at more stable countries like Tanzania, and we thought we'll go to the capitals, we'll meet the agricultural ministries, we will look at the list of land investments, we can just find out what the reality is. 
Uh, the truth was, once we arrived in the capitals, we realized there was no data. Nobody knew what amounts of land have been given away. Did people want it? So suddenly it was an aha moment, like, no, you need to get to the places where the lands have been taken away. So I'll just quickly share some of our key findings from that research. First of all, foreign plantations in developing countries is not a new phenomenon. You know, you have banana republics in Latin America, you have dole plantations in the Philippines, so it's always existed. But since 2007, the rate at which these foreign companies are dashing into the developing world, it is quite incredible. The rates are alarming. In 2011, we determined, and this is a very conservative figure because of lack of information, that nearly 56 million hectares of land had been bought or leased by foreign companies. 56 million hectares. That's the size of France. Over 75% of that is in Africa. Why Africa? As one investor was boasting to investors, the land for which we would pay seven to eight thousand dollars per hectare, hectare is the size of a football field, in places like Malaysia, we pay sometimes even less than 20, 40 cents a hectare. The leases are for 99 years. You don't need to buy land. You lease it for 99 years. You basically own it. The second thing we found was, um, you know, we started looking at some of the things like food security. Most of the places, but before I go there, uh, you know, I mentioned Gulf states. Very often we believe that it is China, it is Saudi Arabia, it is India with big populations. They want to feed their population, so they're taking over these resources. We have looked at hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of land deals all over Africa. Everyone is involved in this land rush, from Norwegian churches to Harvard University to Vanderbilt University to Theocref to private equity investment funds. If you have a pension plan, you want to look at where your money is going. It is going into land grabs in the developing world, especially if it's Theocref. Secondly, what we found in terms of food security, you know, they say this investment will lead to food security in Africa. Africa can feed herself and the rest of the world. It was pretty shocking. A lot of land is just being held. People have been displaced from their lands and they're just sitting on it, hoping to sell it to the next higher bidder. We saw that in Sierra Leone. Uh, Emergent Asset Management, a UK-based company that we exposed, uh, their CEO used to go around saying to people, we can be moronic and not grow food and we will make money. The way these morons make money is they just sell it to the next highest bidder while people have been displaced and communities have lost their land rights. Or it is for exports. You know, you have Karaturi, the world's largest rose grower company from my country, India, that took over lands in Kenya, that took over 300,000 hectares of land in Ethiopia, then declared bankruptcy, destroyed forests, people were displaced, and then just walked out. Totally unaccountable. So imagine Ethiopia right now, we all are hearing about famine in Ethiopia the way we heard in the 80s. This is the same country where trucks of food aid are coming in while trucks full of food grown for Saudi star, for Karaturi, for Ruchi soya are actually leaving the country. While just in one region, in Gambela region, 1.5 million indigenous people have been forcibly displaced against their will. So their lands, their forests can be given away to foreign corporations. The second example I would give, we looked at the jobs. It's supposed to create jobs, right, and create infrastructure. Uh, in Tanzania, we exposed the largest land deal uh, involving uh, Iowa-based Bruce Rastetter, who used to earn, own the third largest ethanol plant. He's a Republican kingmaker. He managed to get 800,000 acres of land in three different portions, claiming nobody lives there. When we actually went to the area, just in one area, 160,000 smallholder farmers were growing food. They were growing food not just for their families, but for the region. They had come as refugees from Burundi over 45 years ago. They spoke ta you know, Swahili. They felt more Tanzanian. Uh, they, most of them were born there. Um, but they didn't have citizenship papers, and they were told, if you destroy your own home, we'll give you your citizenship paper and tell you where to go. Um, when I met Bruce Rastetter, I was asking him that you are asking Tanzania to change the environmental laws 
so you can grow GMO corn for ethanol. You're asking Tanzania to take a loan from the World Bank to put in a railway line from your farm to the port. What are you giving back in return? Are you promising jobs? And his response was, the government of Tanzania is very reasonable. They know what we are looking for. We will hire South Africans, not Tanzanians. Then he paused, looked at me, and then said, white South Africans. <laughs> that statement was taped and played by Dan Rather, and his deal never went through. And those people are still on their, on their land. <laughs> And I'm very glad to report they got citizenship papers two years ago. Um, climate smart. We keep hearing, you know, we have climate crisis. You're seeing a lot of carbon credit schemes. Uh, in Uganda, we were able to expose this Norwegian company called Green Resources, which took over the forest of the people, forcibly displaced the herders. They were no longer allowed access. Good news again, the biggest purchaser, the Swedish Energy Agency. You know, it's, I was telling some friends earlier, it's like a Dracula. When you drag it into the sunlight, it has no place to hide and run, so they talk about climate smart agriculture, carbon credit schemes, but it's a land grab. There's no other way to call it. Swedish Energy Agency has cut off all the financing and the purchasing of these carbon credits. The other big thing is we always believe, and this is, you know, we talked about Black Lives Matter, and we talked about that we have to work towards liberation of the black people. The truth is we have to work for the liberation of the souls of those who oppress the other. Let me repeat it. We who oppress the other need liberation, not the other way around. If we cannot liberate ourselves, we cannot liberate anyone else. And the attitude of racism with which we go to Africa thinking for example, Gates Foundation, that they have solutions for problems that do not exist in the lives of people. They all want to bring development. We all want to bring development, displacing people, widespread human rights violations, pregnant women losing their children, the homes of Maasai is being burned down in the name of development. Help me understand, how does that look like development? How do you call that development? Will somebody answer that? Assassinations of leaders like Bertha, how do you describe that as development? How do you call a large hydroelectric dam development which will displace indigenous populations, which will destroy the cultural symbols, the ancestral graves? Which idiot can call that development? We do. We do call that development there. So all of this so-called investment, which is really a theft of resources from Africa, is happening in the name of development. Let me give you the example of another land deal that we exposed in South Sudan. It was for one million hectares of land. It was no Chinese, it was no Indian, it was a US former ambassador for refugee affairs from Texas, Harvard Eugene Douglas. We learned later he was a key uh, CIA operative in Sudan during the war. But uh, he managed to get a million hectares of land. We looked at the contract. He had a right to cut down all the precious wood that was on the land. He could grow anything he wanted, including GMO crops. He could also go under the earth and look what was underground, oil, diamonds, whatever, and then sublease it to a third party. He got this deal for $25,000. Um, it was beautiful when we exposed it. BBC did a program, and in South Sudan, in Mukaya Payam, in the evening, when there's nothing much happening, there is no electricity, you're sitting with your transistor and a battery, people heard the BBC program. These people who had come back after the Civil War, learning that their land, Mukaya Payam, had been given away um, to Howard Eugene Douglas. Uh, it was August 2011, I was in South Sudan, when this community marched from their village uh, this is before the civil war started again in South Sudan. They could meet with the President Kiir and the deal was cancelled. These are people who have nothing. These are people who have nothing other than their love for the land, the sacred relationship with the land. Um, I share these stories because I want to emphasize about resistance. You know, we live far away. But I cannot tell you the resistance that I witness each time, whether it's South Sudan, whether it's Tanzania, whether it's Senegal. These communities are not just rolling over and letting these so-called powerful rich people march in and dictate to them their lives. Whether it is our work in Papua New Guinea, 
in Asia Pacific, whether it's in Argentina, whether it's in Ethiopia, we're constantly told, this is where I was born, this is where my father's grave is, and this is where I'll die. People are not about to move over. Yes, it is leading to a lot of conflict. South Sudan is not just about the Dinkas and the Nuers can't get together. This is really about the resources of South Sudan. This is about gas, this is about land, this is about you know, a country, even before it became independent, 10% of the land was leased to foreign corporations. So this is a civil war which will decide if South Sudan will be owned by United States or will it be owned by China. That's what this war is about. If you look at my colleagues in Sierra Leone who are facing charges of terrorism or colleagues in Ethiopia, this is not about fighting terrorism. This is about criminalization of land rights activists. This is about criminalizing dissent, and when they can't win against the people who refuse to move, who refuse to be bulldozed by the bulldozers who are destroying their homes and their lands, within that resistance, it raises a big challenge for each one of us. If they don't give up hope, we never can give up hope. And if you're gonna give up hope and we don't have legs of a marathon runner, I think we need to find something else to do for ourselves. You know, when I am there and I listen about Gates and I see the incredible work that the Community Alliance for Global Justice does, you know, my heart starts beating because you are so much closer to those powerful institutions and that powerful man than the people that I have had the opportunity and the privilege to meet. If only their voice can be elevated, if only, and the work you have started with agroecology, when they can come and tell their stories, a uh, couple of years ago, we brought uh, people from Ethiopia, Anuaks, who have been displaced by the so-called development schemes financed by the United States, by the World Bank, and now they're living as refugees in Nairobi. And they could share what this villagization schemes, displacement from land of smallholder farmers, what it has meant for the Bodhis and the Mursis and the Suris in Lower Omo, these agro-pastoralists, and the destruction of the environment, what it really means. So if we can tell their stories and we can elevate their voices to the Gates Foundation, that they're unwanted, they think they're wanted because the PR machine keeps telling the media that they're loved by the world, but in fact they're not loved and they're not wanted. Africa has been very clear. If you meet the activists, the environmentalists, and others, they know what their problems are. They do not want this one-size-fits-all uh, solution that is coming from the Gates Foundation. So I want to congratulate you, Alliance, for the amazing work you have done, but I also come to you with a challenge to take it a notch higher, make their lives miserable, let them hear the voices of Africans, make their voices be heard. because that's what a community alliance of global justice looks like. Global justice, we become each other's voices, we become each other's strength, we become one fist. So I come to you both with a plea as well as a challenge. There's a lot of beautiful work to be done. Um, you know, in the course of all our work, some people started calling Oakland Institute as like, oh, it always brings bad news, a land grab here, exposing these bad guys. So last year we did something that is sustaining and nurturing. We put together 33 case studies uh, from 20 different countries in Africa that if your goal is really to improve food security, if you really do want climate smart agriculture that can deal with the climate crisis, if you really want to improve gender relations, what really needs to happen? We prepared these case studies, which was amazing, which were about you know, the push and pull technique or using SRI in rice cultivation or the use of cover crops. I mean, things that farmers have practiced for generations and generations. What was nice about these case studies were they were not just little cutesy micro projects. They're scalable, impacting millions of people. And then you realize, the truth is we know how to feed the world. You know, there's hunger in the United States, not because this country can't produce enough. There's hunger in this country because of the absence of living wage jobs. We're struggling for $15 an hour for families. For families. Even if I got $15 an hour, I'm not sure I could take care of my family with dignity the way every family should be able to. So 
Hunger is not a problem of food production. It's a problem of control over the land, water, seeds, and resources. It is a problem of living wage jobs. It is a political struggle. It is not a scientific problem that can be solved by Mr. Gates. It is not a technological problem. And what we found from those case studies was the good news is we know how to feed the world. We know how to shelter the world. We know how to clothe everyone. What you and I have to figure out, and I think we have figured out, but we need to move on it, is to get rid of those from power who prevent that from happening. That's a simple thing. There's no rocket science needed. There's no Microsoft needed. Nothing is needed to figure out how we're going to ensure dignity. It doesn't take Donald Trump to realize that idiots might come into power, very harmful, dangerous idiots. But we also know the other choices we have are neither good. Instead of depending on somebody else to do the things for us, we need to become active citizens, global citizens. And I say global citizens uh, deliberately, because each one of us, never mind where we come from, we are citizens. We are not aliens, we are not documented, undocumented, whatever you want to call. We are all global citizens. We belong somewhere, we are rooted somewhere. And with that comes the beauty of the Community Alliance for Global Justice. So the struggle in the backyard with Gates Foundation is not just a struggle and a moral dilemma and actually a moral responsibility of all people living in Seattle. It is a moral responsibility of anyone who lives in the United States. Because you have a very dangerous 800 pound gorilla that has been unleashed. Sorry, why did I say gorilla? I love mountain gorillas. Take that back. I take that back. You have somebody with a lot of privilege, a lot of resources, a lot of, how would you say it in English? A lot of, a lot of influence and a lot of corruption headed out spreading corruption putting forward ways which do not solve people. They might have a lot of power, but I'll tell you, they do not have what I saw here when I entered, the beauty, the smiling faces, the courage, the intergenerational space you have created. It's amazing. I'm looking around, I see different age groups, I see different people, I see different people from different places. They don't have that. And if you have that, and as Phil was saying earlier, if you're right and they are wrong, if they are wrong and we are right, we can only win. So thank you for having me here. Privileged to work with you all. Congratulations again on the 15th anniversary. You have work cut out for you. Um, you have work cut out for you, and if you can do that with five hours, rock the, how do you say, rock the boat in the, with 15 hours a week. Congratulations. <laughs>
This is really about dignity. This is really about building an agricultural system with dignity. Many of us don't realize that while the World Bank to Gates Foundation to USAID want to feed the world, in my part of the world, 80% of the food, 8-0, 80% of the food that is consumed is grown by smallholder farmers. If you look globally, 70% of the food that is consumed is grown by smallholder farmers. It is not Monsanto's and Syngenta's or Cargill or ADM that are growing food for the world. So today, as this uh, evening comes to a draw, I just want to again say, let, let's all of us think for a moment of the farm workers and the farmers who work with the environment, with nature, and use their hands to put the food, the beautiful food, for instance, that we ate today. So I hope you've had a great evening. I know I've had an amazing evening. Thank you so much, Seattle, for once again a beautiful memory.